All right, well, we will go ahead and get started so we can keep this on time. Uh, my name is Nicole Munoz. I'm the Programs Associate for the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take a brief moment to show you how you can ask any questions to our panelists. If you see below, there is a question and answer box. Uh, feel free to write any questions that you have down there. And at the end of the webinar, there will be time uh, for these questions to be answered. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Steve Rosenblatt, who is going to uh, share his family story. So Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Rosenblatt. Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm not a, uh, I'm a physician and not a PhD doctor. Uh, I, I uh, tell these stories out of a sense of obligation to uh, educate people about what happened. Um, I hope by telling stories that I will allow you to establish a moment of emotional attachment to history. History is more than a series of dates and facts. It's, the, it's, it's what actually happens to people. And I hope to uh, share that with you. So let me get my slides up in front of you. Share. Okay. So I'm going to start with a story about a family. And then I'm going to move on to... Uh, other family members and their stories as, as much as time allows. So this is a picture of my mother. Um, she's 14 or 15 years old in this picture. She uh, grew up in Vienna, Austria. Um, she lived in the second district, which was a probably a middle-class district of uh, Vienna, uh, a lot of Jewish population. She went to a private school. Um, her father was a jeweler. I'll show you some pictures of them just to establish a relationship with the family. Um, she led a fairly sheltered life, going to private school, lived, was living a reasonably good life in 1938. Um, let's meet a little bit more of the family. If I can get the slides to move. There we go. This is her father standing in front of his jewelry store. This is her mother, another picture of her father close up, but more importantly, this was some of his handiwork. Uh, he was a jeweler and he designed and carved this uh, silver woman's compact. Um, so there's only three pieces of silver that we have from his uh, time in Vienna. So let's, let's start with a little history. So in 1933, Hitler comes to power, takes over Germany, and begins to institute anti-Jewish policies. Uh, as he begins to expand his military, he begins to argue about Lebensraum, more living room for German people, and he covets the Sudetenland, and he covets the German-speaking uh, country of Austria. In March of 1938, he just marches into Austria. Not one shot is fired. The Austrian government capitulates and Austria becomes a province of Germany. Therefore, in, at that time, my mother and her family become subject to all the rules and regulations regarding Jewish life, which included that doctors uh, could no longer work as doctors, nurses, academics, teachers, none of these people could work for the government any longer. Jewish stores, they would attempt to close, that you had to walk around with the Star of David or a yellow armband on you. So life became very restricted. Jewish children could no longer go to school. So life was not what my mother had experienced up to that point. In November of 1938, there was a pogrom. Let me explain that word. Pogrom comes from the Russian word gromit, which means to destroy by act of violence. And in the 1880s and the 1910s, there were pogroms. There were these riots that occurred in every major city, in every small shtetl, in every small village in the Ukraine and Russia that was fostered by the, the czar 
and the local police and the local military where there would be riots where Jews would be brought into the street and beaten, their stores would be looted, the synagogues would be burned to the ground. If you can imagine, it happens so often in each town, in each village, in each major city, it happened repetitively and so extensively that in the 1880s, over a million people got up and left, many immigrating to the United States. And then again in the 1910s, the same thing happened. So in November of 1938, there was a pogrom, there was Kristallnacht, there was the Night of Broken Glass, where all over Germany, the Nazis sponsored this riot that destroyed and burned 250 synagogues. 30,000 people were picked up and placed into concentration camps. Stores were looted, the glass was broken. In fact, the Germans forced the <clears throat> Jews to use their insurance money to pay for the cleanup. So my mother witnesses this, she's about 15 years old. The Nazis, this is an example of, of one of the synagogues, which you can see must have been a, a beautiful edifice at one point that had been destroyed by the Nazis. The Nazis brought our holy books into the streets and burned them. They brought our Torahs, our prayer books, our interpretive books. So here's, here are Torahs. Torahs are scrolls on which the five books of Moses, the Old Testament is written. It takes a scribe about a year to, to do the whole project. If he makes a single letter mistake, it must be lifted off, which can be done on the papyrus, on the, on the uh, paper that's used, and, and, the, and the correct letter applied. Here's an example that you can see. We, so we spend the year reading through this section by section, study it. Our interpretive books study the laws that God gave to Moses and to the Jewish people. And at the end of the year, we go back and read it and study it again. So here's an example of one of these book fires and holy fires that's going on. So one of these fires is occurring outside my mother's home. She's looking down from her balcony. She sees the fire. Sometime that night, she goes down, sneaks out to the fire and extracts a small fragment of burnt parchment of burnt holy books and places it in her Bible, which was written here in Hebrew and in German, the Bible from which she would do her Jewish studies. She closed this up. And this is the only possession she had besides the clothes on her back when she finally got to the United States. My brother and I were unaware of this until probably about 15 years ago when my mother showed it to us. We looked at it and we were impressed and noticed it and said, uh-huh. And then my mother died about five years ago and then we had the opportunity to rediscover it. We looked at each other and said, if we simply place this in the attic, it's going to get lost and destroyed. So we decided to contributed to the U.S. Holocaust Museum, not understanding what value, if any, that it might have. However, much to their delight and our surprise, this is one of only three such fragments that exist in the world from Kristallnacht, burnt fragments. There are apparently is some at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. There's a Holocaust Museum in Frankfurt in Germany, and now there are these fragments at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. They're fragile and sensitive to light, but they are considering placing these on display if only temporary. So after November 39, at some point, her parents decide to leave Nazi controlled Austria and go back to Poland. Both of, both of her parents had originally grown up in the area of Czestochowa and they go back initially there, then they end up in Warsaw and they take themselves out of Nazi control and un, out of the anti-Jewish uh, practices and policies. However, as we know, on September 1st, 1939, the Germans invade Poland and, and they now are back under Nazi rule. The Germans quickly would sequester the Jews in areas called ghettos, these confined areas either within the city or possibly out in the, the fields or woods somewhere, but they were confined people. So in Warsaw, it was within the city. They began to close off, wall off a certain section of the city and compress all of the Jews into this increasingly smaller area. Over 350,000 Jews ultimately 
were pressed into the Warsaw Ghetto. Movement of Jews was severely restricted. Um, there was no food or water or sanitation provided within the ghetto. The ghetto wasn't completely closed off until about April of 1940. However, my mother is in that ghetto sometime in the fall of 1939. She told us very few stories about what happened during that time. She was like most people, really didn't talk about these things. But she said she couldn't stand the babies crying from hunger. So she used to drop down into the sewers at night, sneak out of the ghetto, and bring bread and food back into the ghetto. Some time after she's there, they get a message from the American consulate office in Vienna. He was able to find them in the Warsaw ghetto and get a message. And the message is that if my mother can get back to Vienna, he can give her a visa so she can go to the United States. The reason being that her sister had already immigrated to the United States about a year earlier and was able to process papers for my mother, but not for their parents. Now it's 450 miles here depicted on this uh, map from Warsaw to Vienna, crosses borders, it crosses through German controlled territory. And yet my mother didn't have the necessary paperwork to allow her to move. Her parents decided even at her age of 16, even considering the fact that she had kind of lived a very sheltered, protected life, that she was going to have to travel on her own to go back to uh, Vienna. So they dress her down, putting pigtails on her to make her look younger, trying to make her less attractive and allow her to find her way back. How she got there exactly, I don't know. Much of it was probably by walking the 450 miles. She told two stories of that trip. The first was that she gets to a, a, uh, a bridge, excuse me. <clears throat> she gets to a bridge and there's a guard there who she is terrified. She doesn't know if she's going to need to bribe him, if he's gonna allow her to pass, if he's gonna violate her in some way, if he's gonna kill her, but somehow she gets across that bridge. Later, she comes to one of these border crossings, but she can't go through the regular border crossing gate because she doesn't have the proper paperwork. So she has to sneak through the woods at night. As she's doing this, along with other people, bullets begin to uh, fly around them. They all begin to run as fast as they can. Near her, a mother is running with a, a, a baby in her arms. The bullet hits the mother. Mother drops the ground, drops the baby. The baby is wiggling and crying on the ground. And my mother always said, I did not and could not stop to help that baby. And I think now that we understand PTSD, my brother and I have decided that my mother probably did have PTSD and we're fearful that she went to bed every night, every, every night thinking about could she or should, he, should she have tried to stop and help that child. She gets to Vienna, she goes to her apartment. She um, finds that the apartment has been confiscated and occupied by someone in the city. She's told if she wants to, she can sleep by the uh, heater in the basement. At night, at, excuse me, during the day, she has to go out and forage for food and find food. She has to, while she's waiting for the paperwork to be processed by the embassy, she has to report every week to the SS. Now I want you to imagine an SS officer with the high collar, tight collar, all the doodads on his chest. And she walks in, she stands before his desk, and she said that he used to take his gun out and place it on the table in front of her while she reported what progress, if any, she was making towards getting her paperwork. So this is her passport. If you look at the top, it says Stadtlos, stateless, because she was Jewish and now Germany, uh, Austria was part of Germany. She was no longer a citizen of any country and she had a stateless passport. Now I want you to pay attention to some of the dates you're gonna see here. This is the visa issued by Donald Selden, uh, the counselor office, vice counselor officer at uh, the Vienna US Embassy. And it's dated February 3rd gives her permission to come to the United States. This sideways picture shows permission that she obtained two days later on February 5th 
from the Nazis to travel from Vienna to Rotterdam. This, this is the distance she has to travel. She has to go 650 miles across Germany uh, to get to Rotterdam to the port. If we look at this page and you begin to uh, look at it carefully, these are various border crossing stamps. What, what happens is that between February, February 3rd, she gets her visa. February 5th, she gets the Nazis to give her permission. She has to travel 650 miles. She doesn't just get on an airplane and travel over there. She doesn't get on a, a direct uh, train with one stop in Munich. She has to take a train to Salzburg, get off the platform, show her paperwork. She's terrified. Are they going to approve of her paperwork and allow her to <coughs> continue traveling? Then from there, she goes to Munich, Köln, Luxembourg, Brussels. Each time she's having to show paperwork to uh, document her travel. It's a terrifying trip. And part of the trip, she's on a, on a German troop train. And my brother and I always worried what might have happened there. By February 11th, she's found her way to Rotterdam. Just an aside, I don't know how to take a bus from the north side of San Antonio to the south side of San Antonio. My mother figured out how to go the 650 miles in short time. So between February 5th and February 11th, she's traveling. On February 11th, she finds a boat and she's out of Europe. It's then when we saw what she was able to accomplish at age 16 that we realized what a survivor she was, how she'd been able to figure out how to take care of herself and get out of Europe. My mother was very smart. She wanted to be a doctor. Uh, the war interfered with that. I'm sure she was happy when I became a doctor, but I know she was ecstatic when her granddaughter became a doctor. This is a picture of my mother probably before she left Europe with her sister. She went to live with her sister in New York and one additional story about her before we change stories, and that is when someone would knock on the door in New York, she would run into the bathroom and lock the door because she was fearful they were coming for her. Here's a picture of my father. Now, my father was a whole different story. He was about nine years older uh, at the time. He raced motorcycles for one of the major motorcycle com companies in Europe, and, and racing there was not run around track as fast as you can, but it was time, distance. Uh, they were a thousand kilometer races. And he actually did quite well. I, I understand he was like number two, place number, uh, came in second in, uh, in a Czechoslovakian thousand kilometer race. And, and he skied and, you know, it was different for him. He comes, comes home one day and grandfather says, here's a thousand dollars, a thousand shillings. He says, you need to leave and find your way out of Europe, go wherever you can, Argentina, Australia, Palestine, United States, whatever you can do. So my, my father took off, and I'll tell you a story uh, in a moment about why that occurred that particular day. He took off, he snuck into Belgium three times. Twice he was thrown out and caught. One time he said he, he found, uh, he, he, he got into the caboose of a coal car and sat in that as it crossed the border into Belgium. When he got, when the train pulled into a station, he got out, was walking down the platform, but a policeman noted the coal dust on his coat and realized that he had snuck in illegally. The third time when he snuck in, crossed the border and he used his gold bar mitzvah ring. I don't have my ring on now, but he traded that with a, a driver to drive him in further into the interior away from the border. He lived for 13 months in Belgium while he was waiting for um, a visa to go to the United States. In order to get a visa, he wrote to every Rosenblatt in the New York telephone book in an effort to find someone who would vouch for him. And ultimately, and somewhat reluctantly, a Rosenblatt who, may, who turned out to be a cousin did sign a voucher for him. But the, the gentleman who signed for him had financial problems himself and you know, felt, in a sense, burdened by having to um, sign an affidavit of support if that became necessary. While in Brussels, there are some funny stories about it. If you, if you had nothing to do, you tended to walk up and down the main shopping street. Police would come along, check your papers. If your papers weren't good, they would drag you back and send you back to Germany. 
he and his uh, uh, brother-in-law would buy a newspaper each day and go sit in the nicest hotel. They would have a suit and tie on, and they would sit there all day and read the newspaper. He said at one point it got to the, uh, it, they became so familiar there, they were able to go use the hotel swimming pool while they, um, because they thought they were guests there. Let me tell you a little bit about kinder transport. So in 1938, England agreed to take 10,000 children, Jewish children, and families all over Germany and Austria had to decide whether or not to allow their children to go to get out of Europe. And in, in England, they were placed in, with families to, to be raised. Now you can imagine how difficult it is. So it's, you can imagine how difficult it is to realize how bad the situation is and how much worse it's going to get. Well, my cousin was one of those kinder transport uh, children. And here he is when he arrives in Brussels. That uh, gentleman is my father. And uh, Henri is sent on a train, not with his parents, 50, 60 kids to a train with a couple chaperones. When he gets to Brussels, instead of going on to England, my father found a Jewish family who said that they would care for him. And so that's what happened to him. So this is Henri's father. So let me use this as an entree to a story about why my father was told to leave. I suspect my father had some notoriety because, or fame, let's call it, because of his motorcycle racing. And the SS came to his father's store and asked for Sam Rosenblatt because they were going to pick him up and take him to Dachau. But my father at that particular moment was not there. The soldiers didn't quite know what to do. They finally said, you know, a Jew is a Jew, a Rosenblatt is a Rosenblatt. We'll take his brother. His brother's name was Adolf or, or um, Dolphy. <clears throat> they took him and he went initially to Dachau and then went on to Buchenwald. It was therefore that when my father came home, he was told he had to get out and leave. While at Buchenwald, um, Adolf, the brother, um, eventually got out, probably because our family figured out a way to bribe some guards, and he was given 24 hours to get out of Europe. He was able to get to England. He had, during that 24 hours, he stopped in Belgium, said hello to his son, and then went on to England to get out of Europe. In England, he changes, well, the mil he ends up joining the military. They change his name to Artie Rutherford to protect him in case he is caught uh, as a soldier. And in fact, it turns out he is sent back to Europe and was evacuated again from Europe at Dunkirk. Now, Henri is hooked up with the Dorn family. This is Mrs. Dorn and lives in Brussels. But as we know, in 1940, the Germans invade and Belgium becomes under uh, Nazi control. They uh, are living in Belgium. They live in a Jewish neighborhood. The Nazis come through the neighborhood and pick up the Jews to move them out. However, the Dorans lived on a little cul-de-sac and the Germans, I guess being pretty straight-laced, didn't go bother to go down into the cul-de-sac. And so they escaped that roundup of Jews. The Dorans then decided that they would find a place to live uh, out in the country and placed Henri with a Christian laundress. And he lived in the back of her store, which was down the street from in Brussels from where the Dorans uh, had, had lived. And he lived in the back of that store for at least three and a half years. He never went out. There was no radio, no television. He had to stay silent during the day because the laundress did not have any children. So she didn't want any of the customers to hear um, a child in the back. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the funny story is that the laundress would go to the library to get books for him. And she would take books at random because she couldn't ask the librarian to help her pick books because the laundress was illiterate. So she would bring books uh, for him to read, which he would read, but he said what well, was funny is every once in a while, she would pick a pornographic book and he would get to read that. He thought, in retrospect, he thought that was pretty fun. 
This is on Ray now at age 86. He's a filmmaker, an author. He's a movie, uh, a TV and movie critic, and he's still actively working. In fact, Tuesday, they're going to start filming a semi-autobiographical film about, about his life. Just uh, for interest, this is my uh, father's uh, immigration card. He came across on the Vendam um, in, um, in, uh, 19, I think, November 1939. This is my mother, um, no, excuse me. This is my wife's immigration and naturalization card. So I, this is a segue into stories about her family. My wife was born in a displaced persons camp in Heidenheim in Germany after the war. So let me tell you how they ended up there. I'm doing okay with time. So here's Central uh, Asia. So let's start off with her father. Her father lived in Lodz, Poland. At the beginning of the war, the Germans are invading. Many of the men decided that the women and children would be okay. So they decided to flee to the east. Little did they know that 15 days later, the Russians were gonna attack and there had, been, there had been an agreement by the Nazis and the Russians to split Poland in half. So when they run into the Russian lines, they are arrested as prisoners of war, and he's sent to Siberia where he works in a labor camp. Now, in 1941, the Nazis decide to break their peace treaty with the Russians and invade Russia. Therefore, the Polish prisoners are released because they're no longer prisoners of war. Her father finds his way down to Tashkent and Samarkand in that area. Um, and so that's part of the story. The next part of the story is that Mary, my wife's uh, mother, who lives in Odessa, as the Germans are beginning to approach Odessa to lay siege to it, the Russians help and the people evacuate to the east. And they basically, her family, her, her mother and sister and parents move <clears throat> towards, towards Tashkent and Samarkand, where they lived for a year or two, actually picking cotton. It was there that my father-in-law and my mother-in-law ended up meeting. At the end of the war, as the war is ending, they work their way back to Odessa. My father-in-law, decides to go back to Luz to see if his wife and child are still alive. My, my, wife, my wife was not aware of the fact that he had been married and had had a child prior to marrying uh, my mother-in-law, his second wife, until she was close to 20 years old. He, he um, her father, had never spoken about that. So he comes back from Luz to Odessa, marries her, and they end up moving west and were smart enough to move into American territory where they lived in a displaced persons camp for two years till they could get paperwork to come to the United States. What I forgot to mention earlier is that my mother leaves Vienna, excuse me, leaves Warsaw to go back to Vienna. She never saw her parents again, and they were among the over 350,000 people deported to Treblinka where they were exterminated. So this is a picture of the Lodz ghetto and there was a main trolley car street going through the ghetto. So they walled off the ghetto, but put a bridge across so the Jews could go from one part of the ghetto to the other side. This is a picture of Warsaw after the war. And you can see the massive destruction uh, that the Nazis uh, extracted on the city. All right, next story. We got time here so I can fill in a few more stories. Um, <clears throat> when I grew up, there were a number of survivor families in my parents' group of friends. And there's this story that when my parents went to Yom Kippur services, Yom Kippur is our day of atonement. It is probably our high holy day. It's a day where we don't drink or eat for 24 hours. We're asking God for forgiveness. We're asking man to man for forgiveness. We examine what we've done in the past year and how we could do better. 
It's during that service they see this young couple standing in the back that seem to be disconnected, not really part of, of the congregation. They go up and they introduce themselves and they realize they had just gotten here from a displaced persons camp and both of them were survivors of Auschwitz. They invite them to our house for a break fast, when we would break the fast after the 24 hours, and they became lifelong friends. And that was the first time that I saw anybody with a number on their arm. Um, and it was Willie who then told me a story at, when I was a child, how he was on a death march. And the death marches were as Germany is retreating, they are trying to destroy the evidence of the extermination camps. And they're trying to take prisoners who were still capable of working for them, and they march them in the cold winter of, of winter of 44, 45, and march them back towards Germany to another camp where they can either work and eventually march them again. Along the way, there's no not necessarily food or water. People drop by the wayside. Willie drops by the wayside. Generally what they did is they shot you and left you there. They missed Willie. Willie revives a little bit later, finds a farmhouse. The lady of the farmhouse gives him some clothes, feeds him, and he survives. So I heard that story. There's another picture of the death march. So in, when the US Holocaust Museum was getting ready to open about 25 years ago, I'm driving to work one morning down Wurstbach, going over to the medical center, seven o'clock in the morning, and NPR radio was having these little short stories about this museum, which was about to open to create interest and help people understand what it was about. And I start hearing the following story about a man on a death march who falls by the wayside, is revived by a, a farm lady, and eventually gets, gets to the United States. It is his uniform that is on display or was on display in the original exhibits at the Holocaust Museum. And it was kind of like getting hit in the chest when I heard that story because it was, it was my story. It was a story that I had heard and it was the story of Willie Luxemburg. When they said his name, I knew, I knew, I knew that story. <clears throat> in the death camps, there were roll calls. You can see this man being held up because if you drop to the ground, you would be sent to your death. Okay, now I'm going to tell you one last story. I may have another one. I'll see what the slides, how the slides remind me. I'll tell you one last story. This is a story I heard from um, a San Antonio gentleman named Gerd Miller, who was in the military. He's now in his upper 90s, and I've been given permission to use his story. Heard it about five years ago at Yom HaShoah, which is a memorial service we have each year to honor the victims, to remember the Shoah of the Holocaust. So in about 1935 or so, his family is smart enough to get out of Europe from Germany. He comes to the United States, goes to high school. He gets drafted into the service, but he knows German and English. So he is put in army intelligence because he's bilingual and can be used to interpret. He tells the story of being with our troops on D-Day. And he's been with them from June of 44 until about March of 1945. He is with soldiers who have now seen the worst of war, who are hardened soldiers. They've seen their friends killed. They've seen people dismembered. They've probably been wounded themselves, recovered and placed back in the line of fire. He's in Munich and he gets an order from his commander that he needs to go 18 kilometers out to the village of Dachau. And he's told, we just found another one of those damn camps. So he's in an open Jeep. He drives uh, with, a, he has a driver and an aide and they're driving towards the camp. As they get close to the camp, they begin to smell something that is oppressive, that is horrible, that is just obnoxious. They get stronger and stronger stronger as they approach the gate. The gates here say Arbeit macht free, work makes you free. There was a, there's a whole other story about how the SS um, worked hard to keep the Jews uh, quiet and keep them from revolting. So this is the front of Dachau. 
As he approaches here, the smell is terrible. It is March, so you see these trees are be just beginning to green up, so it must be somewhat uh, similar to what he saw. But when he passes through the gates, which look very nice here, he sees American soldiers. Some of the soldiers are on the ground vomiting. Some of these hardened, battle-weary soldiers are crying for, because of what they saw. They saw survivors like this who had been living on 180 calories a day and were down to 70 or 80 pounds. They go down, I'll go back for a minute, go back for a minute, wrong way, I'm sorry. I don't know how to make it go back right now, we'll leave it at that. They go down a path, there are barracks on both sides, and they walk into the barracks and they see paper thin bodies stacked up on top of each other. And there are 20 barracks deep on both sides. They get to the back of the compound and the Germans had left out the back door. It took a day or two till the Americans came in. In the meantime, a train had arrived with 2,500 more prisoners for the camp. But the Germans did not open the doors and those prisoners, if they weren't dead already, died in the next day or so until they were finally released. A few of them were found to be alive and this is what the American soldiers found. Okay, there is one more story. Um, this is a group of partisans. These are Jews who went into the woods and lived in the woods for as much as two or three years, set up life for themselves, and would um, attack rail lines, supply lines, and try to disrupt uh, German uh, movement. Um, one of the groups was led by the Bielski brothers, and there's a movie about them called Defiance, which is probably worth seeing. It so happens that my wife's best girlfriend from junior high, with whom she's still very friendly, Adele, her parents were part of this group that you're looking at now and lived in the woods. And I think if you see Defiance, you'll learn more about it. Okay, I will stop there. And uh, I guess I'm available to answer questions. All right, so I see one question. Um, did any other family member on your mother's side survive the Holocaust? The <clears throat> Her sister had gotten here a year earlier and there were just the two of them. Her parents died. Um, there are some uh, aunts and uncles that did get to the United States, but we have not had much contact with them. Actually, my cousins in New Jersey from, um, again, from my aunt, from, from my mother's sister, they have a little more contact with this, that side of the family. And on uh, the same goes for your, your father's side. Is there many that escaped? That's an interesting observation that uh, I've made and other people have made. My, my mother's father had the option, he was a jeweler, and he, he had the option to go to South Africa because he, he could get a job there and then bring his family. And he chose not to, he chose to stay together. In my father's family, everybody went different ways, okay? Artie got picked up, went to Buchenwald, ended up in England. My father ended up in the United States. His sister, uh, his uh, oldest sister was married to Uncle Richard. He was a physician. They were, I guess because he was a physician, he got permission to come to the United States. And they got out with a cousin, Hannah. The other sister, they ended up wandering around through Germany, got to Portugal, lived in Portugal for a little period of time, and eventually were able to get to the United States. Uh, my grandfather and his wife, he was a coffee and tea importer, and what he, he had contacts in Shanghai, and he ended up crossing Russia, probably on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and we have in the museum a picture of a Japanese diplomat who, despite his government's orders not to help the Jews get out of Europe or Asia, he issued uh, transit visas, because at that time in 39, Japan controlled Manchuria, which is now part of Russia, and they had to have permission to travel through there. So my grandfather, in his 60s, immigrated to Shanghai and was in the Jewish ghetto in Shanghai for a short period of time. 
My father is now in the United States. He uh, sells his car in order to send money to Shanghai so that my grandfather and his wife, and his, wife his, his mother, uh, stepmother actually, can get across, the, uh, can get a uh, ship ticket to come to the United States. It, the, the funny little fact is that my grandparents were on the last Japanese passenger liner to cross the Pacific before uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, but so everybody there got out. I mean, the point of the story, we've always reflected on how when a Jewish family had to stick together and you know, protect each other, that that didn't necessarily work. And when everybody create, was independent and was allowed to find their own means and travel and work it out for themselves, that worked. And so there was, this, there was just a certain difference in how they tried to uh, get out to protect themselves. Um, you talked about how your mother was somewhat reluctant to talk about her, her, her past. Did that change as she got older? Or, and what about your father? Did he also was very reluctant to talk about his, his past or was he a little more open? Well, that's kind of like night and day. So <laughs> my mother did not speak much about it. As she got older, she did tell some stories, but she didn't tell it to us. Now, um, she, we had a housekeeper who would go over to my mother's house in San Antonio when she still lived in San Antonio. And she would go over there and my mother somehow would open up to her and tell her stories. And then my mother ended up moving to Washington DC when she needed more care. My brother and my son decided that they, they could provide better for her. There was a, a Jewish assisted living center where she would feel most comfortable. And she was good there for her first year and a half and the last 18 months she developed an increase in dementia before she died. But apparently she told stories, even her dementia, she told stories to her caretakers. My father was a whole different story. My father was 23, not 16, or, you know, he was older, motorcycle racer. He'd been all over Europe. This was, it wasn't a lark, but it was kind of like a lark. I mean, life, you know, I, my brother, he, he did tell us that the place he slept was in the attic of, of a, a red light district house. And we think, he, my father was a big man. He could have been a linebacker for uh, Dallas, okay? I think he was a bouncer. And during the day, he had to go out and, and get food and stay away. But he probably was a bouncer at night and got to sleep there. That's our, our hypothesis. All right, is there any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Uh, do you have any parting words, Dr. Uh, Rosenblatt, before we end our webinar? Well, you know, again, my goal here, most of the time I give these talks to young people, middle school, maybe some high school kids. It's, it's a treat when I get to speak to older people who have a little more understanding, a little more appreciation for these events. But my goal is really to make the history live to try to create a, 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 even if only a short moment of emotional attachment to the story, to the history, and therefore enliven it, not just make it a series of facts. I hope I've been able to do that. And uh, I, feel, I feel it's my obligation to tell the story. And that's why I'm, I'm a docent for the museum. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Rosenblatt. And thank you all for attending. Uh, while the museum is still closed due to the COVID pandemic, we do have a newly designed uh, website at hmmsa.org. I invite you all to go and check that out. We've got many educational resources. You can browse our exhibits and you can see uh, any upcoming events. We can't wait for the day when we can safely open the museum again, but until then, we hope you all stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.